Welcome to First Reading, the Old Testament lectionary podcast for preachers, teachers, lovers, and dreamers. I'm Rachel Wren. And I'm Tim McNinch. Appropriate use of the word dreamer. Mm -hmm. Because we have a text about the Bible's most famous dreamer for y'all today. Today we're bringing you insights into Genesis 37, 1 through 4, and 12 to 28. The first reading scheduled for August 9th, 2020. Yep, and it's an onion of a story, Tim. An, an onion of a story? <laughs> yeah! You remember Shrek? Just like ogres have layers, onions have layers. That's just a little Shrek reference for you there for that late 90s, early 2000s crowd. Nice. Plus, in a lot of ways, the layers of this story sometimes stink. All right, before you run too far with that metaphor, let's come back to the text. Okay, all right, got it. So, our story for today opens upon a young Israelite man named Joseph. He is 17, and he is the apple of his dear father's eye. The only problem is he's got lots of brothers and sisters, and they are not too happy about the twinkle in dear old dad's eye whenever little Jojo comes around. So, okay, before we go there, let's set the groundwork, though. So Joseph is 17, and he is the assistant to the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. All right, remind us who those people are. All right, so Bilhah and Zilpah were servants, likely slaves, of Laban, Jacob's father-in-law. We've got to go back a few steps here to trace their story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When Laban's daughters, Leah and Rachel, married Jacob, he gave... And we should all pause and shudder at that word and what it connotes in this situation. He Mm -hmm. gave his two slave girls to his daughters as a wedding gift. Right off the bat, we are in a major preaching pitfall, which would be to gloss over this little part of the story, to move too quickly past the fact that in the Bible, in our sacred scripture, we have recorded the giving of human people as a gift, it would be really bad to go over past that and not acknowledge the trauma that had to be involved for those two women. Yeah, definitely. Even if slavery in the ancient Near East was viewed differently than it is today, which it was, it was quite a different situation in some ways, it's still not okay. And skipping over this fact could add to the re-traumatization of people of color in your pews. That I totally agree. Mm-hmm. So uh, let us in, remind us, who are the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah? Okay, so we're going to do a quick refresher here because it gets a little confusing. Tim, how many kids did Jacob have? Uh, Twelve plus, maybe? Right, <laughs> yes. that's always We always hear about the 12 sons of Jacob. Mm-hmm, he mm-hmm. actually had 13 children, 12 sons and a daughter. So Leah, back in Genesis 30... Uh, Leah and Rachel have what I like to call a great birth off, which is they are competing with each other for their status as the, the favorite wife. And the way they do that is through having children. So Leah first has four sons. She has Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. And then Rachel, being unable to give birth, takes her slave girl and gives her, again, we should pause and shudder at that reality, to her husband as his wife so that she can have children through this servant. Bilhah gives birth to Dan and Naphtali. Leah does the same with her servant, Zilpah. And from Zilpah, we get Gad and Asher. Then Leah, who is like a fertile myrtle over there, she has Issachar, Zebulun, and Dinah, or Dinah, who is Jacob's only daughter. And we close out with Rachel, who has Joseph, and then dies giving birth to Benjamin. So all of that is to say that Joseph was the helper to Don, Naphtali, Gad, and and Asher. Why did he not help the sons of Leah? It's probably because Leah's sons would have been too direct of a rivalry and competition for Joseph to be comfortable. Um, Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we we hear about that rivalry right away. Verse 3 states outright that Jacob loves Joseph more than all of his sons and because of that gives him a special gift. Yeah, yeah, the coat of many colors. Yeah, the Technicolor dream coat, right? Exactly. Well, sort of. So, as you know, we don't really know what it was. It was some kind of special garment. The Hebrew is really unclear. Um, the word, um, it's coat pasim. So pasim could mean something to do with many colors. Um, it also could have something to do with the hands, as if this is a coat with very long sleeves. We don't really know. 
But what we do know that is that it's some kind of special garment and his brothers get really upset about it. Yeah, yeah. They were they were really concerned about the fashion statement here. <laughs> right, exactly. Long sleeves were so out at that point. That's right. No, we I mean So we know on the one hand that any time a parent shows special treatment to one child, it's going to cause hard feelings with other children. But there was a little bit more more going on here than just that. Um, So first of all, the gift of a garment is hard for us to understand why it would provoke so much outrage. Because today, our closets and our stores are overflowing with clothes. In the Mm. United States, even the most vulnerable populations typically have at least a couple of changes of clothing. So this doesn't really click for us as being something that's so outrageous. But in the ancient Near East, you didn't have multiple sets of cloaks. You had one It was your covering during the day to block you from the elements, and it was your blanket at night. You had one. That's Mm -hmm. why we see this concern in like Exodus 22, verse 26, this concern that if you take a cloak from someone during the day as a pledge that they will pay back a debt by the end of the day, you need to give it to them by nightfall because it's how they kept warm. It's how they stayed safe at night. And in Amos 2, we have this outrage from the prophets that the wealthy were taking these cloaks as pledge and then using them as like kneeling blankets while people were going cold and freezing at night. So a a cloak was a big deal. Mm -hmm. The other reason this may have caused so much outrage from his brothers is um, something that Dr. Carolee Folk, which is really fun to say because she is a recent grad of Emory University in the Mm -hmm. PhD program. Dr. Folk has drawn attention to the fact that the only other time a cloak, which is pasim, that strange word, the only other time a cloak like this is mentioned in the Bible, it's worn by a woman. And it's said to be worn by lots of women in 2 Samuel 13. So if this was a woman's clothing, Dr. Folk has suggested that Joseph didn't fit the gender norms of his culture. And like many people today who are gay or trans have experienced, not fitting those gender norms can provoke a really dangerous rage. Mm, yeah. So, I mean, however you translate that and, and however you understand the cultural circumstances, the story is pretty clear that Jacob's sort of special love for Joseph causes all sorts of problems in this story. It does. And in fact, if you take a step back, if you go way back to when Jacob meets Rachel and Leah, it says very clearly that Jacob loves Rachel over Leah. That's one of the reasons that Leah has so many children. She is literally trying to earn her husband's love in chapter 30, which is just heartbreaking. And then here, Jacob loves Joseph over his brothers, which leads to this sort of jealousy and hatred, which just tears the family apart. Again, quite literally. And as I hear all of that, I can't help but be reminded of this one small little note from the beginning of Jacob's story. Just after the story of the birth of Jacob and Esau, which is already fraught as they wrestle Mm -hmm. in Rebecca's stomach, just after that, it says that Isaac loved Esau. And it's the same word, ahav. It's the same word used here to describe Jacob's love for Joseph. It says, Isaac loved Esau because he ate meat, but Rebekah loved Jacob. It's a short verse, but like many verses in the Bible, the weight behind these words is almost endless. Isaac loved Esau because he was a man's man. Jacob was not a man's man. He lived among the tents, which was where the women dwelled. Now, the text doesn't say that Isaac didn't love Jacob, but the space between those words is really pregnant with meaning. And Mm -hmm. I think there could be some really excellent sermons that that draws out that reality. Yeah, for sure. So so Jacob shows this kind of special favoritism towards Joseph. Um, And even though that, you know, might be nice for Joseph, it also puts him in a dangerous spot, right? It does. And And interestingly, actually, Jacob physically puts Joseph in a dangerous spot. In verse four, it says that the brother's reaction to the gift that Jacob gives to, gives to Joseph is that they're so mad at him that they could not speak peaceably to him. That's the mm. NRSV translation. And it is the Hebrew word shalom. The literal translation here is they were not able to speak shalom to him. 
And what's interesting is that word gets picked up again in verse 14. Jacob sends Joseph to go just see how his brothers are doing. But what he says is, go please and see about the shalom of your brothers. Either Jacob is totally unaware that the rest of his sons hate his favorite son, or he's trying to force some sort of reconciliation between them. Mm -hmm. And Joseph goes. He goes and he finds his brothers and they conspire to kill him. Now, we all know that Reuben steers them away from outright fratricide, but they still end up selling Joseph to a group of traders, the Ishmaelites. Now, what do you know about Ishmael in the story? That's a name we've heard before, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is the brother of Joseph's great-grandfather, and mm-hmm. they did not have an easy relationship either. This is the brother to Isaac, the brother who was cast out for dead. I mean, this story is just plentiful with references to generational trauma between siblings, between parents, and you could broaden it even further as the story is also about slave women who are forcibly made the wives of their masters, Hagar to Abraham, Bilhah and Zilpah to their, his grandson, Jacob. But there's also these layers of references to the reconciliation of that trauma in this story too. It's really ambiguous. Joseph sets out on a journey to find his brothers, which ends in his danger, but it's reminiscent of the journey that Jacob takes to return to his brother Esau, with whom he reconciles. Mm -hmm. Ishmael was cast out for dead, but he actually grew up to live near his brother Isaac and even joined with him in Genesis 25 to bury their dead father together, Abraham. I could easily imagine a story that uses this this narrative to address generational trauma, I could just as easily imagine a sermon that deals honestly with the difficulties of reconciliation, that sometimes the work of reconciliation takes generations, that we are called to steward our past as much as we are called to care for our future, and both is holy work that's guided by God. Yeah, that's really helpful. This is a story that doesn't paper over the pain Mm -hmm. and the struggle that's in real life. And so it's, it's, I think it's a great text to use for a sermon that draws attention to those things in our own context. Yeah, absolutely. I think especially because we're at a time where joy and pain and reconciliation and trauma are more intertwined than can be pulled apart. And so to deal with one, you must also deal with the other. Mm hmm. Well, great. I think that gives us some real juicy stuff to use for some good sermons. So thanks for your prep on that, Rachel. My pleasure. All right, friends. Well, that's going to be it for today. Thanks a lot for listening. Please uh, take a moment to head over to our website where you can see all of our past episodes and a link to subscribe to the podcast. Until next week, I'm Tim McNinch. And I'm Rachel Wren. Happy preaching.